questions, but um, you know, we'll just you know, try and carry on with some of the questions that I've got with you, for you as well. Okay, uh, let's see. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm DC, and tonight we are joined with a very special guest, Dr. Zoe Harkham, absolutely brilliant nutrition researcher, uh, among other things. Um, Zoe has also worked for Big Pharma and Big Food, so mm -hmm. she has uh, quite an insight on the uh, some of the problems that we are dealing with. So, um, actually, would you like to introduce yourself and tell a little bit more about yourself, Zoe? Yeah, sure. So, um... I had a, uh, well, I went to Cambridge University, um, did maths, economics, uh, then did management consultancy, which always seemed a bit weird to me because you're supposed to be consulting businesses and you're straight out of uni and you know absolutely nothing about business. So, hey, there you go. That's what we did in those days when we graduated. Um, right. Then joined the Mars company, um, not actually in the chocolate division or the pet food division or the Uncle Ben's division. So they've got a number of things that deal with food in inverted commas, um, but they had an electronics division and that's the one that I joined. Um, I was there for about six years. Um, great company to work for. Cannot say a bad word against it other than the products uh, are far from ideal, um, but fantastic um, privately run company, brilliant ethics, values, just a wonderful place to work. It really was um, got headhunted by SmithKline Beecham, as it was at the time. It was just at the time of the Glaxo SmithKline um, takeover was uh, was starting to happen. Um, left there um, around the turn of this century, moved to Wales to marry my Welsh husband, and um, then worked for a couple of big organisations in Wales, Welsh Water, uh, the Welsh Development Agency, which was another fabulous job. Got to travel the world with that one, trying to attract inward investment into Wales. And at the peak of my career, I was the um, vice president for some people call it human resources, some people call it personnel and organization uh, for Europe, Middle East, Africa. I've had a couple of board positions on the board of the National Health Service in Wales, which is very interesting, one of the Welsh universities. Um, so all of that is kind of in the corporate world and then kind of in parallel started writing books and my first book came out in 2004, a couple more in 2008, another one in 2009 and I left the corporate world in 2000, end of 2008, um, just thought I'd see if I can make my passion my vocation, I'll have a second career and see if I can do something with this whole diet, health, nutrition kind of field that I'm really interested in then did a PhD in public health nutrition. That was between 2012 and 2016. Um, what do I do now? I read, write, and talk about diet and health and uh, known by guest speaking at conferences, particularly low carb conferences. I'm, I'm not sort of carnivore or even keto myself, but I understand the nutrition around meat and fat and the stuff that needs to be dispelled. And then I do this Monday note and I'm up to about issue number, God, I think it's about 666. That's spooky actually, isn't it? Um, it's about yeah. <laughs> issue 666, somewhere around there. So that's a lot of Mondays where I've taken a paper in the field of diet and health and dissected it. And they've all got something wrong with them. I've yet to see a, a paper that is is perfect and, and should have got through peer review without some tweak or some major uh correction and some frankly should have been retracted but there you go that's me wow that that is absolutely incredible that sounds like you know at least three lifetimes <laughs> my goodness um okay so well everyone obviously you know very well qualified absolutely brilliant on uh, many levels um but today we're going to start uh, dispelling uh, some myths about food um, and you know any kind of diet really, and some of the um, some of the so-called studies that have been coming out recently as well uh, to do with meat in particular. And uh, yeah, but first off, I want to know about calories. Uh, what? How do you feel about cal calories? It, it's a unit of energy. It's a measure of heat. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's the energy that's required to raise the temperature of water by one gram in certain parameters or whatever. Um, it's, it's useful to think of in terms of fuel, 
So in the same way as you might think, how much fuel do I need to put in the car to get from Sydney to Melbourne or whatever? Um, it's it's useful to think of in that terms, but it's it's been completely misused in the field of diet and health and never more so than in the idea that if you just put in fewer calories and try to consume more calories, the body is just going to give up a pound of fat um, for every three and a half thousand calorie deficit that you um, yeah. you decide to impose on your body. I mean, that is just one of the most ludicrous nutrition myths of all the ludicrous nutrition myths. And there are many that I mean, that one's right up there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're not internal combustion engines, um, so it's not going to uh, work the same way, is it? Um, but the the standard um, dietary guidelines, uh, when it refers to calories, is always, okay, eat less and do more things, uh, like do more activity. But for me, the, the thing is, if you eat less, your body just naturally does less activity. You don't want to push it. It it starts to fall apart when you do that after a certain period of time. You know, you might be able to do it for a day, a week, or maybe even a month or so. But after that, you get you get very sick. Your immune system runs down and everything like that. Would that be um, along the? Would that be accurate? Yeah, it's actually about six months. Um, there's a really interesting paper on this by somebody called Marion Franz. And if you look up Marion Franz, 2007, I think it's in the Journal of the American Dietetic Association or something like that. Um, really, really interesting paper. And it's got a fascinating graph in it. So what this team of researchers did was to look at a number of different weight loss methods that fell into the sort of fewer calorie model. Um, so they were either just calorie counting or calorie counting and exercise or just exercise. Um, there was a diet drug in there, which has since been withdrawn because it was causing heart disease. There were these very low calorie liquid diets. And there's a chart in this paper that's just absolutely fascinating. And it shows that all the deficit diets um, lose weight until about the six month point. So it's at about 24 weeks. And then the body starts regaining um, and, and that's where the evidence is overwhelming. So particularly if it's your first calorie controlled diet. So if you're a, a teenager and you're feeling a bit unhappy with your body and you go on that first calorie controlled diet, and we've all probably everyone uh, watching this has been on a calorie controlled diet at some point in their life. And the first one you re will remember was super successful. It was the most successful one. It was the one that caught the body by surprise. Um, the body didn't have time to sort of react and it kind of goes along with it. So in the short term, cut, eat less, do more, create a calorie deficit, you will lose weight. Um, but you're not only losing weight, you're losing muscle, um, you're losing lean tissue, which then also has a calorie requirement. So you're actually setting yourself up for needing fewer calories going forward. And you actually get to the point and you get to the point at quite a low calorie intake that you start gaining weight on a calorie intake that would previously have lost you weight. So you completely mess up your metabolism um, yeah. for quite a sustained period of time. And when I did work one-on-one -on -one with people trying to help them to lose weight, I don't do that now, I just do research. But when I did, because it was actually part of my own research, it was a, a, a you know curious understanding of what is it that's going on with people trying to lose weight. And you don't need to meet with many people before you see that there's a really strong pattern. So you say, tell me when your weight loss problem started. And they say, well, I went on a calorie deficit diet and I lost weight and then I regained it. And then I went on another one and I lost weight and I regained a bit more. And they get into this cycle of trying to fight their bodies. Their body is, is slowing the metabolism down, storing food because it's not knowing when the next daft calorie deficit diet is going to start. So your body starts working against you. And they end up getting much heavier than they were before they started that first calorie controlled diet. So most of them who realize what they've done kind of want to wind the clock back and just say, I wish I'd never gone on that first one. Um, and of course, you, if you haven't done one already, it probably is too late for everyone watching this. Uh, just don't ever go on that first one. You've got to work with your body, not against it. Um, but it will. You will lose weight. There's no question. I mean, these bodybuilders um who attack our world and like oh you just need to eat less and do more you know they're they're relying on what happens in that first six months over time there are a zillion reasons why it's not going to work direct reasons indirect reasons the types of foods that you choose when you go on a calorie control diet you just do everything wrong 
when you yeah. go down that calorie counting route. So just don't start it if you haven't already. Yeah, yeah, it's not sustainable. Um, there's a difference between losing weight and losing fat. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you know, weight overall, you're going to lose muscle tissue, bone tissue. You know, it's connected. Everything just gets weaker, um, and because you get sedentary as well, you tend to get um, adipose tissue as well in the muscles. Mm -hmm. So, you, and then you, of course, you rebound and you get fatter mm -hmm. and heavier, but you're actually weaker than you were before because you have less bone tissue, less muscle mass, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I find that yeah brilliant. Um, so, how are you on? I mean, movement. I know that you are a um, proponent of um, sports. You do a um, CrossFit. Yeah, I do. Not as much as I should. <laughs> it's a wee sort of yeah. time allowed. I walk every day. I've been for a walk already this morning. First thing we do is get up, have breakfast, go for a walk. Um, I've started doing yoga because I just find um, it's a really fantastic stretch, uh, sort of weight bearing exercise, um, stretching, calming, de-stressing, really enjoying that at the moment. Um, I lift things. I lift things in a natural environment as much as possible. So if, if I'm in the garden, and something needs moving, a, a sort of massive stone, bird, water thing or whatever, I'll try to do it rather than calling for hubby, um, yeah. just just naturally trying to do those kind of things. So I, I'm much more pro don't be sedentary than I am, you know, I, I mean, I think it like the worst thing is to just say, right, I'm going to do half an hour in the gym every day and then sit around for the other 23 and a half hours. Um, you're actually better off not going to the gym but just making sure your workstation is user unfriendly. So the printer's not within reach, the coffee machine is somewhere else. Um, don't make things convenient around you, make it so that you have to get up, you have to move, you have to go downstairs, um, you, you have to go and get things. If, if you haven't moved, for, I, I, you know, I can get stuck in research and not want to move for four hours. So I have to force myself, right, go and post a letter in the village post box, um, go and deliver something, move, do something. But I just think we're, we're too sedentary at the moment. And that's the, the single most important thing to fight. Mm, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, like a 10 minute walk every hour sort of thing is great. Um, it also helps you think. Mm. Uh, because Movement is so important uh, for the lymphatic system. You know, the lymphatic system won't work if we don't move. You know, mm. so... Uh, that's something I keep telling people. You have to, you need movement. Mm -hmm. You don't need to cut calories. You need to increase movement, you know. So that, that, yeah, take care. That still won't help with weight loss. So I'm a big yeah. fan of not being sedentary because I think it's good for everything in terms of yeah. your muscles, your bone density, of fighting sarcopenia, mental health, as you say, thinking. It's brilliant for everything. The only thing it's not good for is weight loss. Um, yeah. And I, I uh, really don't think it helps. And, and I think there's some ways that it act, can actively hinder weight loss. You get people who go to the gym and then think they deserve a reward. So they go and have something that really isn't going to help. Um, or they get hungry because they're not fat adapted or they're not fueled in the right way. So they do get some kind of a sort of low blood sugar hypo after exercise. Um, you know, it, it does drive some people towards hunger and fueling in inappropriate ways you know professor tim notes will say uh he developed type 2 diabetes because of being a marathon runner you know he was the ultimate um activity person but because he was fueling that activity through carb loading which is what a lot of serious amateur athletes do um he was completely screwing up his body every time he put a carbohydrate in his mouth so if you want to lose weight it's what goes in your mouth it's not what you do um, what yeah. you do is, is important for everything else. But, you know, people say, oh, just exercise, you know, do more and, and you wouldn't be so fat kind of thing. I mean, it's just, no, that's really not being fair. It's not helping people. No, no. Well, it all starts with the food, doesn't it? Yeah. I was the same when I was young. Um, I was doing marathons, triathlons. I was doing all sorts of things. And, yeah, that even like the coaches at the time were, okay, carbo loading for like a week before an event. So you put on about five kilos before the event. <laughs> oh, wow. And yeah, so uh, that, I mean, it was very easy for me to put on five kilos, you know, at the beginning of the week um, and then try and do a triathlon five kilos heavier. heavier. Mm. It was crazy. But, mm. you know, young and stupid and uh, 
so <laughs> you do crazy things you know like i i i uh i even remember one triathlon in particular i ate a two two kilo tub of ice cream the night before oh wow <laughs> so, yeah but no nutrients anyway. in that or not many anyway a bit of bit of dairy probably but yeah mostly yeah. sugar and uh, seed oils and things. oh but, gosh uh, yeah so horrible things like that but okay so all right so the thing is to stay away from the bad food so mm. what is the right food um real food uh, yeah. we shouldn't need to, I mean, we shouldn't need to call it real food, really, should we? They should have to call theirs fake food and then we should own the term food. But we kind of do need to make the distinction. And you have people say, no, oh, what's real food? It's like, well, you know, if it's on the trees and on the land, it, if it's in the form that it comes in from nature, that's real food. So, you know, I'd say at conferences or something, oranges grow on trees, orange juice doesn't. And, you know, potatoes are found in the ground, chips aren't. Um, yeah. You know, come on, guys, it's really not that difficult. So number one, eat real food. And then my second principle is choose that food for the nutrients it provides. And that's the factual exercise. I mean, the idea that there is debate in nutrition is, is just nonsense. It is a factual exercise. So you take a spreadsheet, you go onto the United States Department of Agriculture, all foods database or Australia will have their own database. The UK has got its own all foods database and you put in a selection of foods. So you put in red meat, white meat, oily fish, white fish, full fat dairy, low fat dairy, eggs, egg yolks, egg whites, if you want to separate it. Um, and then start putting in what they call some of the rock stars of the vegetarian world, lentils, brown rice, um, green things, um, starchy vegetables, green vegetables, fruits, berries, and so on. And you just put a, you know, I've got a database that I use all the time. Um, and you then say, what do we need? What is an essential nutrient? So essential in nutrition means something we must consume. The body doesn't make it. So for example, cholesterol is essential, but the body makes it. So we don't have to consume it. So cholesterol is not an essential nutrient. It's just an essential thing. So essential nutrients, things that we must consume are the essential fatty acids. That's the omega-3, omega-6, but they must come in the right form in the body once omega-3 in the form of DHA and EPA, we need um, essential amino acids. There are nine of those. They're found in complete protein, which more commonly is provided by animal foods. Um, you've got 13 vitamins. You've got eight B vitamins. You've got one vitamin C. Those are your water-soluble vitamins. You've got four fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. And again, any time that there's a nutrient, the body wants the animal form. So um, the, I should have said the essential fatty acids, EPA and DHA are coming from animals. ALA is what would come from flax seeds. And yeah, some people can convert, but the conversion is poor and it's not the same as the body getting what it actually wants. When you come to nutrients, of course, B12 is only found in animal foods. D3 is the form that the body wants. That's the one that comes from sun and animal foods. Um, retinol with vitamin A is the form that the body wants. It doesn't want carotene. Carotene comes from plants. Retinol comes from the animals. Um, the most absorbable form of iron comes from the animals. The most absorbable form of zinc comes from the iron animals. Um, you've got the minerals. And of course, some plants are quite good for minerals, um, but there's still nothing that you can't get from animal food. So yes, you can get magnesium, um, selenium, uh, other uh, copper, whatever you can get from, from plants because they come from the ground. But of course, you can get all of those things in animal foods because the animal foods are grazed on the land and then kind of pre-digested all the stuff for us. So if you follow the second principle, which is then choose that food for the nutrients it provides, you have to choose animal foods because that's where you're going to get all the essential nutrients. And when it comes to meat, you should choose red rather than white because it's just more nutritious. Just put it in the database, compare it. You should choose oily fish rather than white. You should choose full fat dairy and you should choose... Um, egg yolks or whole eggs rather than egg whites. So people in California chucking away the yolks and having egg white omelets. I mean, that's mm. just stupid on top of stupid. <laughs> um, yeah. And if you're okay with plants, and most people are, I do find, um, then you're fine with um, vegetables, particularly non-starchy vegetables. You're fine probably with fruits in season, particularly lower sugar fruits. Um, but think about what would be indigenous, indigenous to your natural environment. So for me, that would be things like root vegetables at this time of year, potatoes, carrots, beetroot, swede, parsnips, turnips. Those are indigenous to my background and heritage and environment. 
and berries in the UK and apples in the autumn. Um, but the idea that Brits should be having strawberries or pineapples on Christmas Day is a is a fallacy that we can't afford to indulge. Yeah. So what are your views on uh, high um, cholesterol rates? Uh, the, the dietary guidelines like here in Australia is what 5.1 milli, um, milliliters, I think it is. But um, I've seen uh, studies back in, two, in the 90s, 2013, 2019, a low cholesterol diet is uh, linked to um, many cases of depression, um, violence and suicidal like depression. Okay, so don't confuse dietary cholesterol with blood cholesterol levels. Okay. Um, and remember, cholesterol is not an essential nutrient. We don't need to consume it because the body is going to make it. And Ansel Keys, the guy who did the famous um, Minnesota starvation experiment back in sort of 1945, um, and also the guy who did the seven countries study, he spent a lot of time in the 50s looking at whether or not dietary cholesterol had any impact on blood cholesterol levels. And he concluded that it didn't. And we haven't deviated from that. That That is not very widely known, but it is a nutritional fact. Dietary cholesterol has no impact on blood cholesterol levels. Now, the only thing that dietary cholesterol might do is it might say to the body, OK, you don't need to make quite as much because the person has just consumed some. But you know, experiments have been done feeding people 20 to 30 eggs a day, eggs, of course, being very rich in cholesterol. And it doesn't make any difference whatsoever to blood cholesterol levels. It might make a slight difference to how much the body makes versus how much the body extracts from food. But the body has a cholesterol requirement and the body will make the cholesterol that it needs to, to meet that requirement. So dietary cholesterol is irrelevant. And I think that the American dietary guidelines woke up to this um, and they certainly did in the 2020 American Dietary Guidelines. It might even have been in the 2015 um, that they actually put in a statement saying dietary cholesterol is no longer a, a nutrient of concern. It's like, well, it never was a nutrient of concern. You know, we've known that for we've known that since the 1950s and that hasn't changed. So it's just kind of like the calories. It's one of those myths that just kind of gets out into the ether. Um, and, you know, saturated fat is bad for you, fiber is good for you or whatever. I do find if you're, you you get a question at a conference and somebody says, oh, what about saturated fat? And you say, well, what is saturated fat? Um, they got no idea. Or what is fiber? Um, you know, just all this stuff that they regurgitate. And when you when you sort of throw it back at them, Gary Fecky, actually, one Dr. Gary Fecky from from your uh, down under, um, yeah. he, he has fellow doctors saying to him, well, you know, what about cholesterol? And he'll say, what is cholesterol? Yeah. And they can't even answer him. So, yeah. you know, it's like, well, shut up and go away until you can answer the most basic question of what you're throwing at me. Just stop it. Just, yeah. um, you know, go away and do a bit of research. Yeah. Uh, th that's the thing too. A, a lot of doctors just don't do enough research in this field. Mm. Um, I think, I think the liver produces about seventy-five percent of the the body's cholesterol needs, and twenty-five percent is stored in the brain too, isn't it? So it's, yeah, it's yeah, of, of what is stored. Yeah, which is yeah. where what what you were saying when you were saying about the su suicide and violence that's related to blood cholesterol levels, and that is yeah. documented. Um, so yeah. in people who have naturally low blood cholesterol levels, there is an association with an increased risk of suicide and an increased risk of violent thoughts. Um, yeah. And that is a, an established association. Um, is it causal? I don't know. Um, we'd need to get into things like the Bradford Hill criteria and test causality. But there is a known association um, between yeah. those two things. And just alone for me, knowing that the brain is housing 25% of my body's cholesterol, I don't want to do anything personally that's going to mess that up. I don't want to take any of those Benicol nightmare plant sterile products. I don't, you know, you, you'll never get me on statins personally. That's me. You know, do what you want to do. Um, but I'm never taking them. Um, my body is making cholesterol for a reason. And I'm going to trust it to make the cholesterol that it needs in the way that it needs it at the time that it needs it. And I'll hope to God that it does carry on doing that and doesn't become less good at doing that over time you know is that what um causes dementia in our later years i don't know yeah i saw something there was a, a good film on that was i think it was called the the big secret actually um it was quite good 
Um, yeah, I agree that the body knows what to do and it does it quite well as long as you give it the right food, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, go, so cholesterol is not a problem. What about fats? <laughs> yeah, to, yeah, fats are... <laughs> People are always talking. About, I have quite a, a high fat diet. My diet is at least seventy percent fat, um, and it has been for uh, quite a while now because it has. I've been using fat to rebuild after so many years of chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, like my brain was just fried. I was fried completely. Actually, it was just my bones, my you know connective tissue, my muscle tissue. Everything was just it was uh, broken. You know. Um, so animal fats, animal proteins have uh, are just essential to rebuild after such mm -hmm. so much treatment. But I keep getting questions. You know, you know, you, fat is bad for you. It makes you fat and makes you. I'm not fat. You know, um, I my cholesterol is fine and I feel fine. And I'm the animal fats. Uh, I think are directly related to helping me think better. Because after the treatment, I couldn't think at all. I for years, I I would um, I would have a conversation with people, and ten minutes later, forget ever seeing them. You know things like that. Um, and it has been um, now it, the the difference has been remarkable mm -hmm. to be able to concentrate again, to be able to remember things again, and to be able to think, you know, and do things again. It's been incredible. So um, are fats that essential to us, do you think? Oh, uh, unbelievably. I mean, yeah, we die without them. Um, yeah. You know, and, and, and I just want to reflect as well. I mean, your backstory is incredible. I remember when you reached out to me and sent me a little video and I just thought, wow, what you have been through is, is just extraordinary. And I really felt for you. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this was to, um, you know, sort of give back to someone who's had so much taken away through... Um, literally being nuked and I know you know that was something you had to go through at the time but um, as you say to to recover from that and to rebuild from that um, you're not going to do it on the the diet that's advised by by public health unfortunately um, so fat we're on my real home turf now because this was my PhD so my PhD was an examination of the two dietary fat guidelines that were introduced in <clears throat> in the US in the late 70s and then, of course, the rest of the world followed. So the UK followed in 1983. Um, don't know exactly when Australia, New Zealand, Europe and all the rest of it followed. But, you know, most countries followed um, the, the sort of the early work of the Senator McGovern Committee around 1977. And then, of course, that got embedded in the dietary guidelines for Americans in 1980, which have then got just sort of repeated every five years. Excuse me. It's quite. Mm. Yeah, you're right. It's dry in our room because it's so cold here. We're in the middle of winter and I've got layers on and big woolly jumper. <clears throat> right, there's I know what it's like. So, um, dietary fat. Um, first, really important thing to get in your head. Um, so everybody picture a little circle in front of you, a little sort of pie-shaped circle and a nutritional fact, and I can give you empirical evidence for this, I can give you theoretical evidence for this, but it's just a nutritional fact, trust me that in any natural diet, and it actually goes for vegetarian diets as well as omnivore diets, protein tends to be about 15 to 20% of your calorie intake. It just does. Um, with, omni uh, with carnivores or whatever, it can go higher. Um, but in, in carnivores such as yourself who are doing sensible things, and not having, you know, skinless chicken breasts and protein shakes and all that kind of nonsense. Um, it's fat that sort of takes up the slack. So you've got your little pie in front of you, you've drawn a little 15% segment, and that's your protein. So the minute you then introduce what they did introduce, which was a total fat dietary guideline of 30%, you can see that you've got 55% of your circle left. And there's only one thing left that we can eat, and that is carbohydrate. So the introduction of the, the low fat, the 30% fat requirement was immediately and concomitantly an instruction to consume at least 55% of your diet in the form of carbohydrate. And when we did that, we didn't know if that was safe. We didn't know if it was healthy. We did not know anything about that requirement. We just decided that fat was bad. And the background to that is the Ansel Keys work, the seven countries study. Um, 
goes right back to Russian pathologists at the beginning of the 20th century. If you want to read the backstory, it's in chapter two of my PhD, which is the review of the literature that got us to this sort of dietary fat place. So my PhD basically said, right, let me pretend that I am the Dietary Guidelines Committee. The time is 1977, and I'm looking at both the randomized control trial evidence, so actual intervention trials where they try to mess around with the fat intake of guinea pigs, human people guinea pigs. Um, so I'm going to look at all of that first, and then I'm going to look at the population study. So that would be things like Framingham, the seven countries study, um, Minnesota coronary survey that came along a little bit after the um, that was around sort of 1983. I'm going to look at both of those separately and then I'm going to use this statistical technique called systematic review and meta-analysis. Systematic review means I'm going to look at absolutely all evidence available. I'm not going to cherry pick. I'm not going to try and bias the results in any way. I'm just going to get all the evidence and then the second part of that is meta-analysis, which is just pooling together all of that evidence in a statistical technique. And then it will pop out with a, this is the sum total of the evidence, then what does it tell us? Um, and those first two parts of my PhD were done back at the time. So it was essentially asking the research question, should the dietary guidelines have been introduced? And of course, there were two dietary guidelines. One was the total fat intake should be no more than 30%. And then it also says your saturated fat intake should be no more than 10% of your calories. And the evidence at the time, to cut the story short, was there was no evidence for either dietary guideline. No evidence whatsoever. Not from randomized control trials, not from population studies. Um, the randomized control trials, which was the first paper that came out from my PhD, and it literally went viral. I mean, it was covered in New Zealand, Morning Herald, Sydney, whatever, um, Time magazine, America, UK. I did about 30 TV radio interviews on the day it came out. Um, <clears throat> it just went nuts because it basically said there was no evidence for introducing those dietary guidelines at the time. They should not have been introduced. Um, it then came up with some other things that caught the attention of journalists. Only two and a half thousand people have been studied in the randomized trials. They were entirely male so no females had been studied whatsoever. They were all sick. They had already had a heart attack uh, or heart disease. So no healthy people have been studied. No women have been studied. And none of the studies individually, let alone collectively, actually concluded that we should do anything about fat. And in fact, a, a few of them, um, the majority of them, I think it was four out of, out of the six, specifically cautioned about their intervention. Um, so one of them said a low fat diet has no place in the treatment of myocardial infarction, which is heart attack. Um, a couple of them said, we're really concerned about the potential toxicity of our interventions. And the intervention, of course, was to put in vegetable oils and to take out animal fats because animal fats were slightly higher in saturated fat than the vegetable oils. So there was just no evidence at the time. So the second part of my PhD then said, OK, but we're not in 1977, 1983. We're in 2016. That's when I'm doing my PhD. So let's repeat the exercise because there will be more evidence available now. There's now more trials. There's a massive women's health initiative trial for starters. So suddenly we do have women that we can throw into the melting pot. Um, we've got 10 trials instead of six. Um, we've got more population studies. So let's pull all of that evidence together. Again, no cherry picking, pull it all together. Is there any more evidence that we should introduce those two dietary guidelines now? No, is the answer. Now, the very final part of my PhD was a, a paper that's very readable. Um, I think it's, um, it's it's only got my name on it. So it's, it, it, you can put my name in PubMed and find it. And it's something like dietary guidelines have no evidence base. So where do we go from here? And that's the final sort of wrap up paper. And what that paper does is to say, OK, I did four studies, um, randomized trials at the time and now, and population studies at the time and now. So I've done four meta-analyses and systematic reviews, but I'm not the only person to have looked at this by any means. Um, I think there were six other teams of researchers, and between us, we had 40 findings. So what I did in that final paper is to say, right, let's just, everyone who's looked at this, let's put them all together. Is there any evidence against total fat whatsoever? And the answer is no. Not one team of research. I know this is just not generally known, is it? Absolutely none whatsoever. And that's not me. That's total agreement across all teams of researchers, even ones that could have been funded by anti-fat institutions. Nothing whatsoever against total fat. Ansel Keys never found anything against total fat. 
he went into the seventh country study thinking that total fat was the problem. He concluded pretty early on, total fat is not the problem. He then decided that saturated fat might be a problem, but in saturated fat, he was counting things like cakes and ice cream. It's like, well, yeah, there's saturated fat in them, but there's way more sugar and flour and um, crap and vegetable oils and so on. So the other teams of research, out of these 40 findings, there were only three positive findings. One was by the, by the Chowdhury team in 2014, and it found that trans fats were not good. We would all agree on that. Pull, pull all of the teams of researchers and say, do you agree with the Chowdhury founding? Every one of us would have said, yeah, good on you for doing that one. Trans fats are not good. Then the other two were from the same team and one was just a repetition of the other. And they said, we think that there's an association between, let me get this right, saturated fat and cardiovascular, was it cardiovascular disease events um, but they also found nothing for deaths, nothing for coronary heart disease, nothing for strokes, nothing for this mortality, nothing for that mortality, nothing for the other, nothing. So they found one thing and they trumpeted this one finding. They didn't trumpet all the other things that were just, we didn't find this. We found no evidence to support this. So they said, well, this. So yeah, sorry, go on, Dave. Sorry, I was just going to say, um, with the, the saturated fats linked to um, heart disease, you know, people have been eating less and less and less saturated fat and heart disease has, and first time heart attacks have been going up and up and up. So there's no, I mean, they, they can't say, I mean, that's a, like a, a reverse correlation there. Yeah. You know? yeah. So they can't, they really cannot say that this is caused by yeah. saturated fat yeah. or, and especially can't link that to red meat as red meat is actually extremely low in saturated fat. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean that that that's absolutely right. The so the two findings that came from this one research team, when they were subject to scrutiny, so they they had been looking at intervention trials. So let's say the Minnesota Coronary Survey um, trial was going to replace saturated, replace some eggs and butter with basically margarines and um, other sort of fake fat products. Um, and they they would sort of look at the evidence from some of those trials, but they in their own paper and, the, and it's a Cochrane paper, so it's it's like eighty to ninety pages long. In their own paper, when they said, okay, let's do a sensitivity test and let's not look at the trials that said they were going to reduce saturated fat, but the ones that actually did, and what were the findings there? And they found there were no findings. So the hmm. same team, if they'd have been honest, you know, if I if I was quizzing them in some Senate panel. And I said, OK, but you've just reiterated this one finding twice. You didn't highlight all the non-findings. You know, do you think that was fair? They've got to say no. And then your own sensitivity test on page 87 or whatever it was found that it, it all fell away under scrutiny anyway. Would you agree? They'd have to say yes. So we suddenly then have six, seven, whatever it was, teams of researchers, 40 different findings. And we all agree there's nothing against total fat. There's nothing against saturated fat. But people don't know this. It's just... It's like the calorie. It's another one of those urban myths where people say, oh, saturated fat is really bad for you. And it's like, what is saturated fat? Yeah. You know, where do you yeah. find it? That, they don't know this yeah. stuff. No, that's right. It's in, because of the education. Um, it's been so corrupted. You know, the education, the propaganda, everything around us has got us counting calories rather than counting ingredients. Yeah. Or nutrients. Um, we should yeah, count nutrients. nutrients. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing too, the, the type of fats, um, these uh, so-called vegetable oils, um, which are basically just machine mm -hmm. lubricants and whatnot, um, even if they weren't so rancid, they, they wouldn't have the nutrients in them to nourish your body anyway, to help your body uh, rebuild or, or just to stay healthy. Um, so... Uh, yeah, that's that's like a yeah, that, 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 that's a really important point, because when you go to the second principle of choose your food for the nutrients it provides, yeah. all oils have only got the fat soluble vitamins. That's the only thing that they can possibly contain. They don't contain they've got no protein, let alone complete protein. They've got no minerals. They, they just have a couple of the fat soluble vitamins and it tends to be E and K. So, for example, sunflower oil would be very rich in vitamin E. We'll just have a few sunflower seeds or get your vitamin E from other sources. Um, they don't have vitamin A. They don't have vitamin D. 
um, you would not, you would just not choose those. So if you looked at them, and, and that's comparing them nutritionally per 100 grams. If I'm looking at 100 grams of, let's say, olive oil, which everyone says is some sort of elixir of the Mediterranean. I mean, that's just such bollocks. Um, yeah. but look at olive oil, 100 grams versus liver or oil or mm -hmm. sardines or something per 100 gram. And then if you want to do it by calories, it's just as bad. So 100 calories of olive oil versus 100 calories of liver. I mean, it's just incomparable. You would never, if you were worried about calories and we're, we're choosing your calories carefully to get maximum nutrients, you would never put an oil in your mouth. You would never, you know, oil should be reserved for people. Um, I mean, you know, not even oil. If, if, if you're following a keto kind of low carb lifestyle and you need more um, food, you need more, more fuel, because you're fueling an active lifestyle and you don't want to lose weight, then you turn to things like butter and lard um, and beef dripping and natural fat on, on your meats. You eat a rack of lamb and you choose fatty meats rather than lean meats. I just can't see why you would ever want to consume olive oil or sunflower oil. Yeah, no, exactly. And for anyone who, um, who doubts uh, this, uh, compared like vegan sort of diet, um, Dr. Harkin was actually vegetarian for somewhat 20 years, I believe, yeah? Sadly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what was the what was the breaking point for you? Um, that's a good question. So I was at a conference in 2010. It was at a Western Price Conference in London, and I heard two excellent speakers. One was Sally Fallon Morell, who's the founder of the Western Price Foundation, and she was talking about um, nutrients very specifically in, in kind of similar terms to how I've been talking in this talk. And we're just not taught that stuff at school. So I, if, if you'd have said to me at the beginning of the conference, what are vitamins, what are minerals, which ones are they, where, where are they found, where do they come from? I didn't know any of that. Why are we not taught that at school? That's way more important than, um, I don't know, some of the stuff that we were taught at school or something, you know, how to appraise something in general studies or whatever. Um, and I remember listening to her and she was particularly talking about vitamin A. That's something she's really knowledgeable about. And it's why we should consume liver or at least oily fish on a regular basis. And I didn't know that vitamin A came in two forms. And there's the animal form retinol and the plant form carotene. I didn't know that some people are poor converters of carotene to retinol. And I worked out during that presentation that I must be one of them because at the time, I went veggie. Most veggies lapse into veganism at some point. They kind of become a bit unsure about eggs and milk and, oh, you know, really should I, you know, you, you get some of the sort of more vegan propaganda or whatever. Um, and it was into one of those sort of vegan periods very, very quickly. I mean, we're talking weeks. Um, and I just didn't make the connection at the time. And I started getting some serious eye trouble, um, really, really painful eye condition. I ended up in an eye hospital in London and the first thing they should have said, particularly young female, they should have said, you know, what, what, what do you eat? Um, and, and I doubt they ask people that question nowadays because if they have seven years of medical school. They have half a day on food and nutrition. And doctors tell me this. Doctors who wake up to our way of thinking, they, they tell me I, I had half a day. How was I ever going to know the kind of stuff that you talk about now? Um, so nobody said to me, what are you eating? And actually, look, maybe you can't convert carotene to retinol, retinol, retina, eyes, eye health. Um, yeah. You're massively deficient in vitamin A. Take a supplement immediately. Start consuming oily fish and liver again and your eyes will be fine in a few days. That's what they should have said to me. Um, but that's yeah. not what happened. So I was listening to Sally thinking, oh, my goodness, I damaged myself um, by doing what I did. And I was feeling pretty uncomfortable. And then Next presentation was Barry Groves. I then went on to speak at his funeral, bless him. Um, he was an absolute trailblazer in this world. I mean, he was decades ahead of some of the people who were saying stuff now. He was saying that 40 years ago. Um, and he did a presentation called Homo Carnivorous, um, Carnivore Man. And he was talking about how the body converts fat and protein and its need for fat and protein, but not its need for carbohydrate and why we need to eat meat and what is it in, in meat that is so important. And I just messaged my, you know, I was under the desk, I was sort of messaging my husband saying, I'm coming home non vegetarian. And he was sort of like, whoa, you know, what should I buy? It's like, start with steak, <laughs> we'll take it from there. 
Um, but I just realized I've been harming myself and I couldn't do that. And then you get into it more and you realize that um, it's not best for the planet. It's not best for anything. So I just, you know, then became uh, super aware of, of the whole vegetarian myth, as Lierre Keith so beautifully put it in her fabulous book. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's two brilliant points there. Um, you know, the, the dietary guidelines, you know, that doctors give out as well, uh, you know, somewhat substandard to say the least. Um, you know, my my particular lymphoma is supposed to be reoccurring and it did come back. It came back twice. It is twice in two years. I was stage four. But, you know, some of the side effects, um, a lot of the things I was dealing with were side effects of the chemotherapy and the, and the, the drugs that they were giving me. But uh, IBS is a big, is a quite a common problem for most people, um, and in particular for me, after the, or the treatment, you know, IBS it was really severe. Like I'd be going to the bathroom eight, ten times a day. Oh, wow! Um, and you know, at the time, going through chemo is extremely painful. Um, but the advice was. You know, and the medications were laxatives and um, eat more fiber and eat junk food because it has no nutrients and therefore won't feed the cancer, um, which all of it is just completely opposite of that. You know, it feeds the cancer and, mm. you know, it, it's all sugar. Mm. Um, so I've I've heard you speak on fiber before, so if you give us a quick rundown on fiber, because I don't like fiber <laughs> for many for many reasons. Um, but the body, I figure it it also treats the you know, fiber is just sugar. It's more sugar for the body to to uh, to try and get rid of as well. And you know, for my case in particular, it would just feed the disease. So, what do you think about fiber? Yeah, I mean, give a quick version. If you want to Google my name and put in fiber, there's a couple of YouTube presentations out there. I think one's 30 minutes, one's 20 minutes or whatever. So um, pick which one you want. But I start off by going through sort of carbohydrates 101. What's a monosaccharide? What's a single sugar? That's your sort of glucose, fructose. What's a disaccharide? Two sugars. That's your sucrose. Um, and then what are your polysaccharides? And we've got digestible polysaccharides and indigestible polysaccharides. So just start from what fiber actually is as a nutritional fact. And fiber is indigestible polysaccharides. So many sugars, poly means many, saccharides means sugars, many sugars that we can't digest. And just straight away, does that sound like a good idea? Um, it's something the body can't digest and it's many sugars. So yeah. How, how does it even get off the ground yeah. as being a good the, the idea? The last thing you should give a cancer patient. Yeah, many sugars. I mean, what did Otto Warburg say? But for cancer, there is one prime cause, the oxidization of sugar in the body. I mean, that was back in something like 67. Um, yeah, well, I think he was working through uh, the Second War. He was in the late 40s and 50s, he was saying that. I think he wrote about that in the just re before he died and professor seafood has been doing excellent work in that field since then too so yeah yeah uh just madness um and uh so what was my next point was um that's fiber i mean i actually i mean just before we finish on fiber i actually think fiber the, the whole narrative around fiber the only possible reason i can think for it at the moment is the carbohydrate narrative is just not sustainable. When you look at nutrition, so you choose the food for the nutrients it provides, you will never eat carbohydrate. If, if, you, if you did that on every single choice that you make, there is always a better choice to make than a carbohydrate. That just always is, you, your oily fish, your um, liver or whatever. So you wouldn't eat carbohydrate. They've admitted that carbohydrate is not an essential nutrient. So the panel on macronutrients, 2005, I think it's page two, seven, something or whatever. Um, they actually admit, the American government admit, you, 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 so long as you've got enough fat and protein, your requirement for carbohydrate is zero. And yet they are telling us to have at least 55% of our diet in the form of carbohydrate, de facto because of their low fat diet advice, that they just will not 
back off from. They will not come out and say, oh, sorry, we were wrong about the low fat thing because they're worried that we'll all sue them for the diabetes and the obesity and the cancer and the heart disease that we've developed over the last 50 years while we've had this low fat, high carbohydrate dietary advice. So I actually think the fiber narrative is the last bastion to, to try to protect the carbohydrate narrative because of course you only find fiber in carbohydrates. You don't find fiber in, in fat and protein um, meat, fish, eggs, it's fiber free. Um, so it, it's a way, if you take that away, if that actually came out and said, oh, actually you don't need fiber, where is the rationale to eat any carbohydrate, let alone at least 55% of our diet in the form of carbohydrates? So I think once they put these states in the ground, they've just shown themselves to be remarkably inflexible in moving away from them. And I can only assume, you know, perhaps one, they don't want to look daft, um, but I think the litigation worry is the bigger one, because think about it, a new health secretary could come in and say, look, it wasn't me, it wasn't on my watch, you know, the last 50 years of those really bad guidelines, nothing to do with me, sorry guys, you know, I'm coming in, I actually think you should eat real food and, and mostly fat and protein and manage your carbs very, very carefully, particularly if you're overweight or have diabetes, but why don't they do that? Because they could be the hero. They're not kind of throwing the five decades of previous health secretaries to the to the wolves. And I just think that the incumbent government at the time is the one that gets sued for the advice of the previous 50 years of, of government. So I can't see them ever backing away from it. And the same with diabetes organizations, diabetes charities, for goodness sake. Um, yeah. You know, people who are volunteering, trying to do the right thing by people with diabetes. They know, they absolutely must know that telling their um, their people to, or telling anyone with diabetes to major their diet on carbohydrates is a crime. And they're supposed oh, to be a charity and they, they still do it, so. Well, they want to stay a charity, you know. They want to, they want that money to keep coming in too. Yeah. You know, cancer is the same. Um, yeah. But, you know, I've, I saw um, even the... Um, what was it the the uh, American um, Diabetes Association? They have on their website they have recipes for cakes and all sorts of you know garbage food, just absolutely nuts. Um, the other point, um, just quickly before we go, uh, sustainability. Now this is um, something that a lot of people don't understand: the sustainability of raising cattle compared to um, you know. Uh, farming uh, grains. Your take? <laughs> well, I mean, quite simply, one gives back to the land and one takes from the land. Yeah. Um, and, and vegans just don't seem to realise this. So, um, you know, you go back to the English agricultural revolution back in the 1700s and we had the three field system. And that's still the perfect agricultural system that has not changed that the people who worked it out at that time they got it right and nothing has changed since to make that not right so the three three field system was one year you have animals um, grazing on the field and those animals were therefore particularly the ruminants so that's the cow sheep deer are ruminants goats are ruminants um, so they have this sort of unique stomach system take the cow four stomachs um, so they regurgitate microflora, they consume microflora. So just the whole sort of chewing cycle, they're giving back to the land, taking from the land, hosting billions of microflora, putting it back on the land, um, chomping away, doing fantastic things for the soil. And at the end of them grazing on the land, you've got all these incredible grasses and um, things that then attract bumblebees and other fantastic. I mean, it's just so fantastic for nature and the environment. The next year, you should then put crops in that field because that soil is really rich, rich in minerals. And the crops can then take those minerals and then the crops are then healthy for humans because they've got a good mineral content. And then you leave the field fallow. So you leave it time to recover. It's recovering from the plants having been in there. Um, and it needs to recover so that then when the cows go back in there, they can start doing their good thing and rejuvenate the topsoil. And, that, and that's how nature is supposed to work. And of course, farmers would have more than one field. So the, the landscape in, in sort of old paintings that you would find Constable or whatever, um, painting the landscapes in the UK, you'll see um, fields have got grazing animals and fields have clearly got crops and there's fields with 
um, bright colours in them, whether it's rape or poppy or whatever. Um, and then fields just looking like they're not really doing very much um, or tilled over ready for the, the next cycle. And, and that's how our countryside was. Well, they don't want to do that anymore, um, particularly in some countries. And America is the worst. Britain is still pretty good because we have a lot of land that you cannot use for crops. So we have a lot of mountainside when, frankly, the only food that can be um, grown a sheep because they can graze on the mountainside not even the cows can graze on the mountainside so a hill farmer that I in interviewed recently Gareth Wynne Jones working up in North Wales um, he's got something like three and a half thousand um, sheep up on the hills of Wales uh, and that's the only thing that can grow up there so that food is all on land that could not be used for anything else so it's given to the food chain um, yeah. But what we tend to do with the rest of it is put one crop in with loads of fertilizers and then another crop with loads of fertilizers and then another crop. And it's just rape the land, rape the land, rape the land. And the walk that we go on every morning. So we've done one already this morning. Um, the roads are currently brown, mud brown. Um, and that is basically topsoil washing down the drain out into the sea Um never to come back again onto the fields. It doesn't then get picked up in the cycle of cloud and all the rest of it. It's too heavy. Um, it's then sediment at the bottom of the ocean or whatever. And that's our topsoil gone and it's gone forever. So we used to have topsoil that was feet thick. It's now millimetres thick. And of course, in America, they don't even bother having the cattle grazing on the land. Most of the time, they put them in concrete sheds. They then grow crops or break down the Amazon rainforest to grow soy beans or whatever to then feed to the cattle who are in concrete sheds um, to then put the cattle into the food supply. And that I'm totally with the vegans on that one. I mean, that is just heinous. Yeah, well, that's stupid. how you get, uh, that's how you get uh, Wagyu beef. You yeah. Uh, they pretty much just sit in the shed all day and just yeah. eat. Um, so they get that adipose tissue. Um, yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, that's another thing too is, you know, like the UK gets a lot of rainfall. Mm. Um, so that that topsoil will, will wash off, but those the rudiment animals, you know, they they pretty much just uh, process grass, fertilize the the grass, and then pound it into the to the ground to create that topsoil. Um, this is something you know. So many people just don't are so ignorant too that they pretty much. Um, they have, that is the most sustainable system to have you know like mm. there's nothing else that that, that can make a, a better system than a cow um i think in australia the topsoil is a big problem it's a very dry country it's the driest country in the world mm. um so it doesn't have a lot of rainfall um compared to places like japan but um the topsoil um is almost non-existent in in many parts because it just it doesn't have they do a lot of grain farming um like in japan they grow a lot of rice but the the water will they'll have uh, layers and layers and layers of these rice fields and the water will just run down each one but it still takes a lot of water to grow rice and growing like again like australia should not be growing grains like rice because it's it is such a dry country it takes a lot of water to do that in australia um, it takes much less water to grow to uh, grow cattle, and cattle will actually give back to the land. Will actually produce that topsoil that we need so much. Um, so, when it comes to things like sustainability, um, especially in uh, in Australia, like a dry country like this, gro growing grains like rice does not make sense. Mm. You know, good especially example. the way they do yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a really good example. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. There's there's actually there's so much more I'd really love to talk to you about. I mean, it really is. I could talk to you for days, honestly. I've got so many notes here that but uh, I think we'll leave it at that today. Um, Dr. Harkham doesn't have a whole lot of time today, so we're really privileged uh, for her to spend the time with us. Um Actually, have you, if you've got time, just one question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, if you've got one that you, you're going to die if you don't ask. So, um okay. I'm good, but um, <laughs> someone's come up, have they? Lisa, yeah. curious about your views Please. on dairy. I love dairy. Um, I think I would get most of my calories from dairy if I actually worked it out. I, I, I like milk. I like 
whole yogurt. Um, I like cheese less than some people, but there are some cheeses I quite like. Um, dairy is quite an interesting one. So dairy has a real ethnicity connected to it. So when you look at the evidence for dairy intolerance, um, your chance of being dairy intolerant as a white Northern European, so that would be me or someone in Norway, um, Sweden or something like that, is it's actually really quite low. I mean, it's below 5%. Um, your chance of being dairy intolerant with Asian ethnicity is the other way around. It's like 95%. Wow. Um, now, I don't know what it is in Australia, but there is a, a massive sort of genetic heritage uh, to dairy. So, um, you know, if I were a holistic practitioner and I'm not, and I had somebody walk into my practice in London and they were white um, saying, oh, I think, you know, dairy isn't great for me. I'd say, well, you know, let's explore it because your chances are you're probably OK with it. And if someone of Asian ethnicity walked into my practice, I say the chances are you're not OK with it. I mean, it's just that that easily divisible. Um, but I'm a really um, strong supporter of getting to know what works for you. So one of the best tips I give anyone when they say, oh, I'm not sure what might be causing a problem or this, that and the other guys, you've got to do a food diary and you do a food diary religiously for two weeks, I guarantee you will find out things that work for you and things that don't work for you. So you take a blank workbook, every single thing that goes in your mouth other than water, um, anything, whether it's coffee, whether it's black tea, even if it doesn't have calories, but it might have caffeine, um, every, every gram of fat, protein, carbohydrate, every single thing that goes in your mouth, you put down on one side of the page and on the other side of the page, you write down how you're feeling. So when you notice something, so you might write down um, breakfast, whole oats, full fat milk, um, grams of each, if you want to be really specific, or just the items, you're going to identify the problem. And then that's 7am. And then you might say 9am, feeling hungry, feeling bloated, um, feeling good, feeling energetic, you know, had a good workout, whatever, make a note. And within days, you will be able to look back at that diary and go, do you know what, every time I have bread, I bloat, every time I have swede, I bloat, I'm okay with carrots, but I'm not okay with swede. <clears throat> and then you start, excuse me, looking into things like FODMAPs, maybe, so certain um, uh, vegetables that are more harmful to some people than others, the whole sort of oligosaccharides kind of thing. You If just Google FOD, FODMATS, you'll get into that territory. And you'll really quickly work out what's okay for you. So people who've ended up going carnivore, and I'm actually talking to Georgia E tomorrow, um, who's another person who ended up sort of essentially taking almost all plants out of her diet. Um, I'll be interested to see how did she know that plants were a problem for her. And it will almost certainly be through some process of observation and then elimination. So you observe that something might be a problem. You then take that food out of your diet, um, keep the food diary for a certain period of time. And then you just get to the point when you realize what's working for you and what's not working for you. Um, dairy works for me. If if Lisa is saying, you know, it's clogging her up and she's not feeling good about that. Second part of the question, you know, is it essential for anything? No, um, everything that we need, we can get from meat and oily fish. Um, eggs are really, really nutritious as well. If you can do eggs, um, they're really, really helpful. Um, things like calcium, for example, you've got as much calcium. Um, if you think of the bone nutrients, calcium, vitamin D and phosphorus, vitamin D, you should get plenty of that in Australia from the sun. But I just think everyone should be taking a D3 supplement, mega dose vitamin D all year round. Why wouldn't you? Um, because it's going to help ward off everything from viruses to perhaps more serious illness. Um, if you take D3, uh, D then you take K2 to make sure that the calcium is going into the bones and the places where you want it to go and not staying in the bloodstream. Um, but, you know, when I look at it, that there's more calcium in um, bones and, and skin fish. So if you can eat a tin of sardines and the soft bones are in there and the skin is in there and, you, you know, mash those up or whatever, um, you're getting all the nutrients you need. You're getting calcium from that. You get calcium from water, um, but particularly oily fish, a really good source of the of the bone nutrients. So no, you're fine without dairy. Um, if you're finding that it's a, a problem for you, um, keep the food diary, get the confirmation that it is and then back off. And then you can try reintroducing it. I mean, I did go through a period in my 20s when I just couldn't tolerate dairy. I was bloating. I was getting bunged up. I felt 
really sort of nasally and like I had a cold all the time. Um, left it out for a good period of time and it was probably a good couple of years and then just naturally kind of went back onto it and found everything was fine. So maybe there were other things going on in my world at that time, maybe stress, maybe there was some other stuff that I was eating that wasn't helping and it was just the dairy on top that tipped everything over the edge. Another thing is um, your source of dairy. Uh, you know, in Australia, unfortunately, like raw dairy is illegal <laughs> for some reason. Um, but you know, raw dairy is going to be much better for you than, mm. and full fat is going to be much better for you than any sort of processed dairy, mm. uh, especially uh, like raw dairy uh, products like butter is, is like a superfood. It's fantastic stuff. Um, Can you get raw cheese then? No. What? No. I mean, if I look through or, the fridge, it almost yeah, all the cheese, or, you know, I deliberately choose the raw cheese, the unpasteurized. Yeah, wow. Yeah. The, all raw dairy in Australia is illegal. Must yeah, be good for you then. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It must be great for you. When I go to, when I went to, I was in Japan just a few weeks ago. Um, you know, raw dairy products were everywhere. You know, um, Naku, you, know yeah. you know, picked up the big cake of butter, and there was just two ingredients: raw milk and and salt. Hmm. That was it. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, but here, unfortunately, you know, you can't get it. And it's all, you know, a lot of it, uh, such as milk, especially low-fat milk, it's full of sugar. Mm. Um, another thing about, uh, like, bone health, like bones are mostly collagen as well. So you get a lot of the collagen and uh, also your vitamin D3 and things like that also mm. comes from fat and uh, uh, meat. So, yeah, uh, if you it, it increase your meat, um, then I don't think your, your bones will... I mean, it'll be much healthier for your bones anyway. Mm. Your bones should be flexible to be strong. So and that's what, you know, that's why you need collagen. So, well, absolutely fantastic talk. Thank you very much um, for your time and taking the time out. I know you have a, an extremely busy schedule and I don't know how you get it all done, to be honest. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for joining oh, thanks us. Thanks for having me. It's been really fun. Thank you. Uh, I'll just drop us out here. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining the chat. And I will leave links to other talks of Dr. Harkham's on fiber and um, some other just brilliant talks. In the, I'll leave that all in the description for you to uh, check out later on. Okay, guys, see ya.